Hey, it looks like us as we're live. <laughs> Welcome to How They Got Hacked, episode 39, 39, the last episode. Of the year. Of the decade. Of the decade. <laughs> I mean, we kind of got after it a little late on the whole decade thing, but yeah. Yeah. Last one of the decade, nevertheless. Yeah. Nevertheless. Oh, man, and another last for in person for now. Well, for, for now. now. Mo. Yes, this is my last episode in person okay. for at least uh, a couple weeks. Yeah. Not Hopefully I won't uh, be missing longer than a month. Oh, there you go. Yeah. He's got to get settled in, the new location, new job, new fun yeah. stuff. I'll be able to bring you guys new stories, more in-depth analysis of that's some his, of these cases. He's going to be doing in-depth analysis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm going to be doing that from now on. So That's going to be fun. Yeah. We got people from Costa Rica in here. Ooh, nice. I love Costa Rica. It's a lot nicer. It's actually been really warm here, though. It's been in the 50s, 60s. It's warm. That's what happens when this the devil is a... headed back to hell. It's been a snowless <laughs> Christmas. The portal opens up. The portal opens up. It was colder here in Halloween than it was for Christmas. Exactly. By like 20 degrees. Exactly. I love Las Vegas. <laughs> and it's just odd because this is the so, supposed to be the winter wonderland. Yeah. And now we just don't have snow I at like all. I like it. Hey, listen. Christmas. You know, I have. I'm a photosensitive guy. I, I have a prescription for it. Seasonal depression is a thing for me, so I'll take this little 50 degrees. Yeah. You know, it did. I'll, it I'll it definitely helped with the seasonal depression mm -hmm. with it not being any snow, so I'll you take, can't. Still I can go move around. Right. His move birthday around. was just a couple days ago. Yes, I'm a Christmas baby. Yes, he was born on Christmas. <laughs> Holy shit, Christmas! Yeah. yeah. Oh man. Yeah. No, no, uh, you get the same gift. You're like, oh, one package. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. My family and friends, uh, they've been giving me two gifts since, okay. I, you know. There you go. Yeah. My cousin's born on the 27th, so she's got that problem too. We just we get her like, I always get her her Christmas present, birthday thing. <laughs> or they always, either, if they do give me one gift, it'll be like one really nice gift. Well, that's not bad then. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> so a whole lot of stuff for this week. We got someone from the UP. Uh oh! There, I think there's some snow up there. Oh, it's always. <laughs> <laughs> it's a whole different world it's up a there. World. <laughs> we get all kinds of fun stuff in here. Oh man, too so, much fun stuff. Too much fun stuff. Uh, one of the ones I'll, you know, I realize I don't think I can play the audio through here, but we'll we'll leave you guys a link, and uh, it's not worth playing the whole audio, but it's a, it is transcribed here. Uh, basically, we talked about how the rings things uh, rings were getting hacked. Mm -hmm. Well. The some white hats were out there being bros, man, and they're being helpful to people. They were uh, offering and contacting the people via their ring doorbell because they could log into their account <laughs> and uh, talking back and forth to them and letting them know that they were hacked, saying, hey, I'll let you know your password. And it's funny because it's a great conversation. Uh, read through in the show notes. It's, it's actually, he had a three-minute conversation with the guy who owned the ring. Wow. <laughs> the guy was pretty freaked out, but in the end, very happy that this person had contacted him because it's better that this person did than someone. Else. This, exactly. I'm going to go get a ring and I'm going to set my password to one two three four five six seven eight nine. And to see how long it and takes to make a new friend. To make a new friend. You know, like <laughs> I was just going to say, it's like that. my phone number, neighbor. Like I, I'm just after it for new pals. Like yo, look out for me while I'm away. Like if you see an alert, set it up on your phone too. Hit me up. You know what I'm saying? If you see something, say something. Let's just be ring pals. That's going to be a new thing. There you go. Yeah, I'm Hackers okay. making friends. I'm okay with this. This Hackers is actually. Bros. Yeah, we want a pen pal. You just set your password one, two, a three, four. A pen pal. A pen yeah. test pal. A pen so test pal. There we go. Pen test you. Pal. <laughs> we we got to trademark that Come or something. On now. I kind of like this as an idea to make new hacking friends. I do too. <laughs> or, I mean, I'm or serious. You can just I really come like to DC313 and hang out with us. And also, you can come to MySec Detroit and hang with us. So every single week in Detroit, Xavier D. Johnson has an event for you to come to eat, drink, and be merry. <laughs> you don't even have to hack. Did we introduce the number episode and our names? Mm. Number episode. We got the episode introduced. we didn't get our names. Oh. So we should probably say our names. Tom Lawrence. <laughs> I am Xavier D. Johnson, also known as Mr. Robot, also known as... <laughs> no, <okay. laughs> I'm Maurice Nash, also known as Mo. Hey. So there we got that part out of the way. You now I know who you are. And th yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah, we just had to throw that in there. No, some, it's no. important. Honey so, yeah. friends, right? Yeah, honey pot friends. Honey pot friends. There you go. Just, yeah, I like these are ideas. all great ideas. These Let are all great ideas. You know what I'm <laughs> I like that idea. <laughs> so it's <laughs> interesting enough. I got my parents that ring doorbell, and I'm thinking about getting myself. <laughs> not, no, it wasn't ring. It's nest actually. It wasn't ring. They got the nest one, mm -hmm. and I'm thinking about getting the nest one too, because it's nice to be able to see who's at my door. Uh, sometimes you knock on my door, ring my doorbell, I don't answer it. Was I expecting you? I'm a Detroiter. That's how you get robbed. <laughs> 
Right? Like, you know, like they're, they're checking to see if I'm an old lady or something, and they can just be like, sign this petition. Still one of your packages. Yeah, you don't want that. See? Speaking of honeypots, honey um, this is kind of fun, and this is what you get when you have a honeypot. Someone did this right up. This is just on December 21st. Defender uh, quarantines LSAS dumps. And the the fun thing about honey pops honey pots is seeing what they do when they get in. And uh, this was interesting. Just it's just a real basic write up, but uh, what they try to run, how what they do when they get in there. Uh, this is how you. It's a great way to learn when you have the time to run a honey pot and maintain it. Yeah. And, uh, watch what exactly they're doing, how they dump things, how they then turn it into a. Uh, turning off Windows Defender, what tools they use. And that's actually kind of fun is the fact that they get all the dumps. And we've mentioned this before, but, you know, it's still kind of cool. Source IP, when indicators of compromise, Russian version of uh, RU, uh, RU version of WinRAR. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, of course. Yeah, of course. Why not? Well, of course it came from Russia. Well, except for Mother the day it didn't Russia. come from Russia. I don't know if you've seen this or not, but Russia went offline. Oh, when yeah. did that happen? So they've been working on this for a yeah, while. I know, I know. When they managed to do uh, it. Let's see. Russia managed to disconnect the entire country from the internet. Oh, yeah. I did see good. this article. Yeah. Good. That's According, a good thing. Yeah. According to the country, recently conducted tests that allowed to disconnect from the internet and create the world's largest intranet. Now, mm-hmm. I, yeah, I guess it's just that's the amazing. Russian internet. No, that's amazing. Yeah. It, you know why? You know why it's amazing? Because hmm. it's going to get hacked, like, immediately. Oh, yeah. Because they're using all internet-based technologies mm-hmm. on their intranet. Mm. And anytime you roll your own anything, yeah, you're just going. You're asking to be pwned. It's like mm-hmm. I cannot wait to figure out when the guy, the spy, is like plugging in a thumb drive <laughs> into the internet computer and and ransomware's the entire internet and they can't back up because the internet's not connected to the internet. Right. <laughs> I well, mean, but another place that they also do this in is in Cuba. Yeah. Cuba, huh? Yeah. So wow. they have an internet there, you know. So all the locals. Well, that's because they don't have access to the internet. Yeah, I mean, but they it's still very, very just don't give it to We don't right. give it to them. It's a yeah. munition. Yeah. yeah. And that's what and that's a lot of the theory surrounded is that Putin wants to maintain power. You maintain power by control. You know, the, the flow isn't money. The control and power is based on information. If you mm-hmm. can stop the mm-hmm. information from flowing and you control the news and propaganda. Um, and Russia is known forever to have very tight controls on their news outlets. The Internet kind of breaks that controls and the power they have. Uh, China struggling to hold on to it is part of the reason there's so many protests and things and some mm-hmm. of the unrest that goes on over there is because they're fighting the control where people want information and uh, – then China doesn't want to have it, and Putin sees the same way. He's going, you know what? This makes sense. Where's that off switch at? <laughs> and if you can control, you know, your people from talking to people on the outside, you for oh, sure. Yeah. That's just yeah. I mean, you you read through the history of the Arab Spring and things like that. That mm-hmm. a lot of that had to do with information flow, but them being able to coordinate to have those uprisings. Mm-hmm. The internet was a key. They had Twitter, uh, letting people know where the police were, where things were, where activities are going on. You dive into that; it's really interesting. What as a strategy? I think to myself, like, hey, I, I would take more of the approach that uh, China and the U.S. have, and really the five eyes. So Germany and, you know, Europe as a whole. What happens is this, we just look at everything. We're breaking as much encryption as possible, or and or if not breaking it, putting our thumb on you to say, <laughs> hey, you must give it to us for national security purposes, right. or you are right. in contempt of, like, because people are using your platform to do things, mm-hmm. and... I need to be able to see because that's what's happening right now. Yeah. So from my perspective, and the only way to really protect yourself, we already know we've been preaching the same thing. It's not only way, but one of the ways, Tor, VPN, VPN over Tor, please, yep. gosh. Um, or Tor with VPN is, is the, the method. But nevertheless, uh, it, I think that versus actually shutting your people off from the Internet, being if you want to locate and identify radicals within Monitor it all, find how radicals move, identify them, go remove them. Otherwise, by shutting off the access out, outbound, either they circumvent that and then you don't, you're don't. you always playing cat and mouse on the perimeter, yeah. or they completely leave the intranet and communicate on something that you do not monitor and it's out of band for you entirely. Right. True. Or you, that's why you just turn off the whole internet. <laughs> right. But then, like, but then, like, what happens when you got things like satellite and cellular and all these other ways yes. to communicate? When when Elon gets the whole Starlink system up. <laughs> it's going to be really hard to, like, stay covert. It's the more connected you get. And it's, uh, it's opposed to people who want to run authoritarian governments because they run it by maintaining misinformation or the information flow as they see fit. So it is going to be really interesting. Uh, 
But on a fun note, I say fun, but it's uh, this. So nuclear bot author arrested in sextortion case. So th- this is the guy that wrote the oh. nuclear bot. But oh boy. more specifically, do you guys remember those uh, sextortion cases where they would have a password in the header of your email on the subject line? Yeah, hey, we I know what one. you've been watching. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I think everybody yeah. got one. Yeah, that's... And we, all of us said, that's a scam. Yeah. I had a lot of clients freaked out calling because wow. apparently that was the password for their uh, activities on Oh, sites yeah. Like it was Pornhub. a legitimate password. Yeah. That's what I thought it was. Yeah. And they were one, <laughs> my favorite one, <laughs> my favorite client call that was really awkward was first he was angry, but then he let me know. He goes, I'm 60 and I'm proud of what I look at. <laughs> and he goes, I'm into women my age, man. He's not going to embarrass me. <laughs> I'm just like, there's things I don't want to. I'm just like, you can stop now, is what I said. Right. I'm like, he, well, you know, I was going to say, it's nothing bad. It, it's, I like girls that do this. And he's like, I'm like paused. I'm like, uh, greatest hits, dude. Just told him I mean, pause, like pause, I learned pause. a lot about him in that couple minute phone call, <laughs> more than I ever wanted to know. I he felt compelled to share because he was so angry at the person, and I just let him know, calm, change your password for everything, including the porn sites. It don't was, worry, don't pay the money. It's basically like somebody took that dump, that like one of those dumps, like <laughs> yeah, got, and just mm-hmm. sent the email to everybody that had yeah. an email with that password. Yeah, that's a good phishing uh, technique. That's not a bad one. I mean, but it was such an old password that I was just like. Wow. And it was a dumb password. It's a really, the only time I used it was I got one too. And the only time I use that password is on crappy websites that I have to create an account on. Mm. Like, I know what password I use. I'm like, I use that password on shitty websites that, that I don't put in last they had was so old. That was to an email I can't even get access to no more. <laughs> I mean, of I'm course. Like, damn. Of course, <laughs> mine was to a dummy email. I didn't care. I was like, you can have it. Take Go it. ahead. Take it. I, I take all my, my items offline anyway. <laughs> exactly. Ah. Mo was like porn up account. Who has one of those? I know who actually <laughs> signs up for one. I don't know. <laughs> There's no free stuff on there. And if they would have, you know. Yes. Yeah. What are you going to do? Um, now, this is very vague. And if anyone has more information, I mean, Bruce Schneier is the authority on a lot of crypto stuff. So when I seen he posted it, but he's also being vague, he just says, interesting story how a Chinese state-sponsored hacking group is bypassing RSA secure ID two-factor authentication. Mm -hmm. That's scary that they're doing it, but it's all speculation. Like, it appears they were able to bypass it. But nobody, I mean, this I got tagged in this on Twitter. I got people messaging me this. And I'm like, I don't know any more than you guys know because... It's so vague that they think they did it. Now, there's some theories in here that they actually, uh, there's ways to get around. Or like, they actually got a copy of the same token. Mm -hmm. So they aren't really, they didn't really break it. They just were able to acquire the same token, probably through some type of social engineering. They know Mm -hmm. which token they were issued and were able to replicate it. I don't know the details. Mm -hmm. Um, But the this is the more concise Bruce Schneier version because it's spun out of control. when people, by time, uh, by like, yeah, it was yesterday uh, that he posted this, but the other day when people first started posting it, all 2FA is dead is how those, you uh, know. <laughs> well, I think, it, I think the reason why is because this article is written in a way in which it explains the problem with it being the seed. Yeah. And if you understand how 2FA and MFA works and TOTP specifically mm-hmm. and how these RSA tokens are programmed and works, the seed is extremely, extremely important. It's like the most important thing yes. uh, to all of that. And so I guess oh, from reverse engineering, the seed from the token is what everybody's been after. Mm-hmm. And so I guess that's why people are like freaking out. Like, oh my God. I could see why someone who, there's still some research to go. That's what yeah. I said. Like, this is a really good step because I think that, uh, you know, TOTP to me seems a, a little entropy weak. Um, it, it seems like it has some single point of failures like the seed. Like if yeah. you've ever managed enterprise IT systems with machines and devices that actually have to authenticate to one another to make REST calls and get tokens from AWS, I've done some complex things, fortunately. You run into a problem immediately of seed management and then people like HashiCorp Vault kind of solves right. uh, for this problem where like they manage your seed for you. Other people like Paul Erickson would actually take his seed at the time in which it was generated and stored somewhere so that if he lost his phone or if he lost the device he could actually go and restore his totp tokens based on the seeds you know well, um so that is super interesting this is fun 
type of stuff. It is. And here's where things go completely off the rails. I thought this was a joke in the forums. So in a private IT Facebook group, someone had come up with a solution they thought was clever until mm -hmm. they got flamed in the group for doing this. <laughs> they started collecting the 2FA seed tokens for TOTP, like the QR codes, mm -hmm. and then published them. They came up with their own, which is always how things go even worse. Mm -hmm. Apparently, they were trying to host them on WordPress, so they had a URL that their staff could easily get to so they didn't have to ask the clients for their 2FA. So they'd set up 2FA, have the client of the TOTP scan the QR code, then they keep another copy on a WordPress server oh, so Lord. they could easily access it and then we're using uh, some type of script so it could always have the uh, scripts available on a website that mm. was password protected in WordPress you know because that's secure mm. I'm just like you did what? <laughs> like <laughs> This is a horrible idea. And they didn't think it was a horrible idea at all. They took the post down because everyone's like, tell me you're joking, right? And, and this is when something like SQRL shines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Right? And this is, if I was working on that, I would be jumping on this and be like, see, see, <laughs> see? And this is why. Um, <laughs> this is just a level of ridiculousness. So sometimes it is some, and that may be what the end result is. You'll find that some company goes, yeah, we were worried about backing up our tokens. So we put them on a public server, unencrypted, right. and we have all the tokens just sitting here waiting to have something happen to them. <laughs> You know, it's just like all those cameras. You can still find these when you do camp webcam searches. How many webcams are pointed at an RSID token? Yes. <laughs> There's, that's been going on for years. That was like the method by which people shared it. Bro, like, are, those to those Jamalto and RS token, RSA tokens are so coveted. They actually, like, they're like, you get knighted. Like, in these environments, when you get these tokens, when these are in your desk under lock key, like, it's a big deal like yeah you know if the thing blows up at two o'clock in the morning they call you because they can't even log in to the root account without you so you're very pivotal that is like man if they break that if it really works i'm staying speculative here myself mm -hmm. but if someone's able to make that happen and they don't publish it if like let's say an adversary does that the world burns yeah that's a world burning event because no, we can't we have we haven't even been moving forward we can't get people to get TOTP tokens widely adopted to begin with. Yeah. So we can't V2 it. So if V1 <laughs> gets broken right now, it could very well, like, it's, dr drown the plant. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's definitely a mess. And the seeds will drown. And, and uh, you know, and you see in movies, and I, I finished Mr. Robot, I won't spoil it, but they, one of the things they have to get is the TOTP tokens. And how do they get it? They realize that they have a realistic challenge of just going to the person's place that has it and getting in the gest drawer where it's at. They like, right. you know, it's, it's, it's the, problem. yeah, it's a legitimate problem. And then you get there and you realize it's not there because it's in a safety deposit box right. at the bank. Right. There's the whole playing back and forth of figuring out where you get it from. So that just kind of, you got to have a bank that allows you to have 24 hour access to your safety deposit box. Yep. Oof. Yep, yep. So there's ways to solve the problem, but uh, convenience and security are opposed to each other. And yes. people who create WordPress collections of customer tokens. And so, just... and so I want to leave you guys off on this note. I will not leave you yeah. guys, but I want to, I want to, this year is coming to an end. And he just hit on a really hard topic that I've been pushing along in my circle. Security and convenience. Mm. Where they meet is where people need to be attacking. That's where I want to leave it. Right? Think about the forgot password functionality. Uh, think about the, the uh, 2FA over SMS. Think about Twitter's feature to allow you to be able to, um, you know, reverse search phone numbers to be able to find people's Twitter's accounts. Oh, yeah. Um, Do you get a job? feature to do that. I mean, yeah. anywhere where that security and convenience boundary overlaps is, as an attacker, your dream. Because you're like, oh, okay, so you wanted to share files but you didn't want to manage search, so instead of SFTP, you made FTP. Mm -hmm. Cool. Mm -hmm. right? We're just going to use username and pet. Oh, since you didn't want to have more than one FTP user, you used the root user, right? Like, convenience it and security are diametrically opposed, so anywhere you can find that area where somebody's made a compromise on security to make something easier to use for their users, mm -hmm. bounty, yeah. it's going to rain money. Well, and this is... Uh Great, this is directly that problem. So this is over on Reddit. You can spend some time in our sysadmin because uh, this is a place where a lot of sysadmins will rant about things and rant about problems that are created by management above them. 
And th there was a uh, flaw found in the Citrix uh, Netscaler product. It basically, like, really bad, get it fixed right away and patched. But this is right now. Still waiting for our change approved to get back before I touch it per our policy. 24 hours later, nothing. It's a great system. And you'll see a lot of this. This is the bureaucracy that sometimes hangs up security. Y you see this kind of discussion uh, all the time. And like this person say, no urgency. Just trace yourself and then uh, yeah, trace yourself, brace yourself until the shit happens. Mm -hmm. And I've talked to a few people that worked, my friend who worked in the government for a while until they finally started approving stuff. There were so many layers to get things improved because he worked for the state, not military government. And at the state level, he's like, yeah, he goes, this is some patch that needs to be loaded from last month that still hasn't got around to the bureaucracy allowing me to load it. So we're hanging out just waiting to get hacked, you know, on this uh, server that we have exposed because we can't patch things without a person signing off on authorization above me. But... You have to make sure that you've smoke test, <laughs> unit test. Mm -hmm. You got to make sure that you've done all the security <laughs> testing. You got to make sure that, you know, there's some, it has to fit into a sprint. Yeah. Right? And if it's inside of a sprint, you got to get the resources allocated. The resources that you need to work on this may be on vacation. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. remember being outside of these problems and looking at it like, well, why? And now I kind of feel for these people because... Bros in Jamaica, girlies in Greece right now because they all get paid well. Um, I'm here in Detroit. The problem is in in um, is in Denver, and we got two engineers in Denver, and none of us that's available even work on this thing. Mm. It becomes like a uh, I gotta reach out to this person. He has limited availability, you know. Uh, it it gets really really interesting. And how about this? I remember being in situations where yeah, we could get the patch done like that. But the smoke test, you know, take 24 hours to run. Yeah. You know, when you got a big application, you know, to actually have yes. JUnit go in and click everything and take screenshots of everything and actually look at our acceptability rate and have that meeting and go over that KPI. And even if this is something that's, you know, critical bugs like this, luckily at Dynatrace, they have a 24-hour KPI. Okay. They make sure that anything that's critical, high... They put a 24-hour, we have to get this done in 24 hours. Mm -hmm. But then they have other things that drop down into like 72 hours, and they have some stuff that's like two weeks and some stuff that's months, right? Because it's all about, you know, chewing, biting off what you can chew. Right. So they, even though they have these huge unit tests and smoke tests and all that stuff, they rather get the patch out and then regressively test. Yeah. I think it becomes a strategy thing. And it's up to the people that are the most senior, the people that are, are wanting to get to that next level and be executives, to explain to the executives in the ways that executives communicate, which is not verbally. No. They communicate via slides. So you put this shit on a slide and explain to them, hey, this is how long it takes to run a smoke test. This is how long our unit tests take. By the time we get this patch, this is our potential impact. Mm -hmm. If we patch this today, even if it introduces a new bug, we, we're able to continue to do business. It's not going to affect us. Our customers yes. will be back online and protected. And then over the next 72 hours, we'll make sure that all testing is done. We'll put a team to go and, and fix any bugs that arise from that. That was my first introduction to sales is I had to sell it to the management of why we need something, why we need to buy this, why you need to patch this. Those are important aspects of your job in IT is being able to sell that. And especially like this, in, in, and this is almost ridiculous because you're not talking about them being the application writers. These are just the patchers. You're like, look, there's a problem with Netscaler, which is, you know, how we publish all of our apps that corporate uses. Right. It can allow un unauthenticated users. So what's the risk of that? Well, it, do you guys do business in Europe? That's, that's how that conversation, this is the first slide. Here's our European fine we estimate if someone uses this app and accesses all the customer accounts. And hopefully you don't need slide two. Right. <laughs> patch that shit is what you're hoping they'll say but you do have to present it you do have to think about it and it is that um our system can give you some ideas if you're getting started in this careers i know a few of you asked that question how do i get started um listen to the veterans and you'll learn there's there's some challenges you're going to get in when you yeah. the uh, learn beards. The people the gray beards. beards because the, the gray beards are my i time will tell you like <laughs> everywhere i've worked i've had gray beard <sighs> friends and i've always taken them with me and tried to bring them in other situations because they know stuff. And what happens is is you ask a whole bunch of questions. <clears throat> and the gray beards are typically patient enough just to go answer, 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 answer. And so it allows you to be able to scale up in a straight line upward immediately by throwing yourself in these uncomfortable situations, sitting back, mm -hmm. observing, 
asking questions, observing, asking questions, observing, and then taking action to try and replicate what you've learned. And from that, you find how to make the immutable infrastructures and how to think about, you know, putting keys into this new infrastructure. Yeah. And 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 then the the the, the small idiocracy is like, oh, okay, you know, in Secrets Manager, you can't have two secrets with the same name. So if you destroy a stack and rebuild another stack, and in your template that you've written, you got the same secret name, you've screwed yourself. You won't be able to come up. So it's like you got to be able to like uh, sit back, observe, take note. And, and kind of like learn the great beers are very very good for that and not i'll say if you can get a junior position somewhere and are extremely inquisitive mm -hmm. then you'll rank your next position could potentially be senior yeah <laughs> how hard is it to simulate management with a learning ai it's there's you can never simulate the amount of random you'll get from management that doesn't understand technology they will sometimes love you and hate you and that the same person that can be those things two things can be two different presentations an hour apart <laughs> i don't think that ai would ever be able to simulate management because management is um 80 people and 20 percent um subject matter expertise and what managers do is they find extremely bright people that are motivated and hungry to be able to to do whatever it is that they have a vision for, right? Yeah. And managers are very uh, less attached to the the how and more so the the, right? The it happening. So, um, yeah, that's my take on it. Yeah. And, and you're I right. Think, I don't think AI would ever be able to no. do that. No, and Fendrix is right. Um, ideally, you would have different tools, and um, such as uh, what you mentioned, Terraform, and then a few others, Terraform Docker to rebuild your infrastructure around dynamically. Yeah, those are wonderful levels to get to at De DevOps, where you can just say, trash the server, keep the data, rebuild the infrastructure on the latest build, uh, pull out everything, put it together, and restand it back up. That's awesome. Uh, that's a great. That's a good goal to get to. Um, but the other side of that, too, sometimes you just have to patch a Citrix server. <laughs> that's that's a, a, a whole different topic. But then if you ever have to patch that Citrix server more than once, you should have automated it. Yeah, you should have automated it. <laughs> Even if the automation is wget extract tar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to opt. Yeah, anytime you can automate any of the uh, that, it's, it, well, of course, then you, uh, what is that other software we are hating on for all the half dozen episodes? The, uh, the Confluence? Confluence, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's and if, a pain to update though. Exactly, that's no joke. Yeah, uh, there's an entire team. Well, that's what I'm saying. One day, <laughs> one day, if you could write a whole system that rebuilds that automatically, well, well, you'd put my friend something. Jay out of a job. Yeah, you're onto something. <laughs> and that's a, that's the thing. A lot of companies internally are replicating, and they're not even putting that shit out on GitHub. There are people that do have systems where you can click a button and it'll inline patch everything mm -hmm. and let you know and test it for you. But they won't release. Why would they ever release that? That yeah. cost them yeah. six months of development, three dudes, and that's like, you know, one point five million dollar tool to them. Yeah, <laughs> my my friend works for a company. That's what they do. They spend a ton of time supporting Confluence, and it's a team, and yeah. they have a ton of automation tools internally that they wrote. But they still break every time there's a new version of Confluence. He said it's like the most impossible job, but he says it's also really good job security because no one will ever get off this shit. <laughs> well, for sure. Yeah. Anyways, uh, the hacker who, who took down a country. Which one you guys threw this in there? This looks sound interesting. Yeah, I threw that in there. The attack against Liberia began October 2016. More than half a million security cameras around the world tried to connect to a handful of servers by Lone Star Cell MTM, a local uh, mobile operator. And Lone Star's network was overwhelmed. Internet access for 1.5 million customers slowed to a crawl, then stopped. Wow. So it was a pretty big DDoS. Liberia's Minister of Information was in Paris <laughs> on business when the crisis began. That was planned. <laughs> oh. Could have been. Could have been lucky. Wow, this I is... I feel like people stalk people. Very, everything is planned. <laughs> a lot of it is. It... There's... Is this kind of related to Dark Knight Diaries when he covered some of the people breaking into the cell phone networks? Oh, boy. I wonder if this is kind of related to that because it was about how they slowly acquired access into the back end. Wow, this is a lot. Yeah, that's a lot. It's just a good read. I threw it in there, you know, since we put up the show notes. So yeah, if yeah, anyone yeah. wanted a good read, that's sort of like a Darknet Diaries. Yeah, this is like a whole step by step write up. Definitely, yeah. <laughs> definitely great there. So it, uh, yeah, I didn't, I, sorry, I didn't, I skimmed it a little bit. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. Because yeah. what I did want to talk about. So I think we've covered like, some of the main stories, but this is the one that we can have some fun. We can reminisce down memory lane. Mm. 
And uh, let's. This is the last year in malware here. <laughs> and if you let's roll it back though. If you roll it back, 2010 Stuxnet. So that's what happened. This that's the malware of the decade. We'll start there. This. Wow. Yeah, I know that's been 10 wow. years since Stuxnet. Yeah. Oh, wow, dude, I'm getting old. I know. You're like yeah. I was there. I remember when that was hey, news. I remember when that was news, man. That mm -hmm. was that's that was one of the things that drew me into security. Yeah. And that that was a uh, Stuxnet is turning ten. Yeah, that was interesting. I graduated high school in 2010. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I hacked my school network oh, in 2010. You know what? You know uh, what I'll look saying? it up, Rico. What was the other one? Uh, that the, drew the first me deep. Project Aurora, I believe. No, not the aircraft. Uh, Project is it? Project Aurora hack. That was what year was that one? Operation Aurora. I'm sorry. 2000. Yeah, that was 2010 as well. This was um, this was the Google hack, the supply chain hack, the um, Juniper, Sony. Mm -hmm. All these people were in this. This was a oh, Chinese yeah. state sponsored. This is when the this first hit there. So it was China versus a lot of other places. They hit Adobe, Juniper Networks, Rackspace, Yahoo, Symantec, uh, Northrop, uh, Morgan Stanley, Dow Chem and Dow Chemical. So there's this the last ten years has been a lot of stuff. What year what? was a Sony hack? Uh, Sony hack. Twenty fourteen? Twenty thirteen? Twenty fourteen. Twenty fourteen. Yes, sir. I remember this. That definitely goes down as one of the biggest hacks. Oh, that yeah. was one of the biggest ones. It changed the landscape of things. So I think you know, Operation Aurora. So obviously from a state sponsored level, when you think about uh, Stuxnet, that's the first time we've actually had like absolute state sponsored. We're watching two nations mm -hmm. head on um, cyber warfare, straight right. up. Approved by the people <laughs> in power. Approved by Obama himself. He signed off on that I think right it's, there. I think it was one party. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like a one-sided show. Well, yeah, well, I think it, it certainly ignited the other party, but it's definitely the U.S. actively oh, yeah. engaging in direct cyber attack. Because Iran has a strong cyber program now. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It, for, <laughs> for, for, for an interesting reason, because we talked about the others. And then this right here, Operation Aurora, this is also the other superpower, um, China, going after us. So what they call themselves, PLA Unit 61396. Mm -hmm. um, so that was them. And it's the China going after specifically U.S. companies, probably U.S. government in some way, but not documented here, um, that was at least recorded, but certainly going after, you go after Google, Adobe, and Juniper, especially in 2010. Dude, Juniper. That was a, uh, Juniper's still a big name in the enterprise networking market, so uh, that's probably pretty big. The Sony hack was definitely a pretty big one. Um, I don't know. I, what I'm curious, what do you guys think the biggest hacks were? Those are the two couple that came to mind. Biggest hacks in the last 10 years? Yeah. Bro, it's been so many hacks that have been claimed to be the biggest. That yeah. I can't. I, can't. I mean, WannaCry, right now we're in the year of WannaCry ransomware. That was huge. That, Wa was, that was just 2016. Yeah, WannaCry was 2016. Or, 20, or 2017. Yeah, WannaCry um, was huge. So that was like in the middle of the decade. Right before that, I think the Sony thing was the biggest thing before that that I could remember. Uh, let me think. Uh, I mean, to me, it's kind of like, uh, I guess it depends what, I mean, I guess a hack is a hack, but what kind of hack? I mean, I feel like yeah. whenever Whatever five it makes... trillion passwords get exposed, that was a terrible hack to me. Yeah, and when you in the because like the the whole Yahoo hack yeah. with it, everyone getting their Yahoo account hacked and those people being in there, that was really interesting. I don't know if it was. I mean, it made now the we, numbers. Bro, do you remember? Now we discuss the hacks that Equ take down networks. Equifax. Equifax. Think, that's probably the biggest. My Fitness Pal. <laughs> that was a huge one. My Fitness Pal. My Fitness Pal. I was think the huge. Equifax. That even leaks data from the from the the, uh, the U.S. government. Yeah, I mean Equifax is big in terms of uh, number of U.S. citizens affected. Definitely. So you had the kind and of and the popularity. Like yeah. that became a household. Like yeah. Equifax got it, hacked. Is it Equifax bad? People who like, weren't is... even into security. Like Equifax got hacked. Like... And the Sony hack too, because uh, one we learned Sony. I, I actually knew a guy who was uh, part of the incident response team. Cause that mm -hmm. happened on Christmas, right. Uh, right? Right around the holiday season, and the incident response team dude going out and having a beer with him. He's just like. Jesus, this was the dumbest shit I've seen. He goes, Cisco, because he's a Cisco engineer, their Cisco shit was all default passwords all over the place. Mm -hmm. He goes, just no bro, concept. Bro, remember <laughs> remember Deep Root Analytics? No. Y'all remember when the uh, Republican, uh, Republican Party got hacked? 
Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was just in 2017. I remember. Yeah, yeah bro. Then the DNC. That was a huge. One. All of all the voter records got leaked. Oh, yeah. Okay. Bro. Yeah. yeah, yeah well, yeah. was was the the was OPM was uh the the personnel was that in the last ten years? All yeah. the spies getting there and their yeah. data leaked. Oh, when they got yeah. <laughs> yeah, bro, that was like 2014. Yeah, that was. I like, got breaches coming out my ears, bro. It's been bad. <laughs> yeah, the, <laughs> you're right. The, when was the? I'm gonna look that up. When was the OPM one? OPM was terrible. Um. Zynga got hacked. Starwood got hacked. Yahoo got hacked in 2016. Yeah, those are the you know the these are the big the... these are the big name brands. 2015. So, th- and this OPM was <clears throat> right that smack dab in the middle of the decade. Yeah, this was really interesting. You dig into the OPM hack, and the reason why is because IT staffers with the United States Office of Personal Management, the agency that manages the government Call civilian workforce. <laughs> yeah. Uh, discovered that some of his personnel files had been hacked. Now, what's interesting is when you fill out the SF-86 forms, which contain extremely it's personal... The most. The most. Everything about oh, yeah, And Ashley. I had friends that are military contractors. The Ashley Madison hack. Yeah, Ashley Madison. That's a whoo. <sighs> yeah. Bro, the last 10 years have only been hacks. We should do the, the greatest hacks of 2000 till 2010. And then it might have been a little bit more difficult. <laughs> I feel like the last 10 years have been like... And then you guys know the hack that started this show... The Baltimore Rams. Oh, yeah, yeah. Man. All the different oh, city not, Rams. Not Boston, right? Not Boston. <laughs> not, Boston. <laughs> not Boston. But you know what? That, I wouldn't say if there's something remarkable about 2019, it was ransomware. Ransom. We can just stamp oh, ransomware yeah. on Listen, the, and what, if you want 20... to hear more about it, go to my channel, Xavier D. Johnson, on YouTube. I have a ransomware, the hottest ransomware yeah. last summer, and it's about 20 of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And the, yeah, the ransomware, well, was, you know, of all the different things, like throwing miners on stuff when, when Bitcoin was high um, and all the different uh, cryptocurrency. Oh, yeah. Mage card. Mage card. Mage card. That's still happening. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> That's still happening. Zynga got hit this year, too. Oh, they got hit again? Yeah. 218 yeah. million. Wow. Yeah. yeah. But... The OPM have probably, that's one of those ripple effect ones because the level of personal detail in there, like where mm-hmm. your kids go to school is on those forms. Mm-hmm. And as I, I was talking to my friend that um, had to do all the debrief stuff because they're a military contractor and they were just kind of going over because they were military and then worked as a contractor on their civilian. And they're just like, dude, you know how much information is there? They worked in IT and they were just kind of covering all this. And I was like, wow, mm. like those forms are just... That that's got a lot of the the Star Hotel one, which was they Star were in there. Marriott. Star Wars, yeah, Star Wars area. They were in there for like seven years. They had went through an acquisition. Yeah. Yep. I mean that was like game changing. When, when you when your uh, persistent threat survives an acquisition. You remember <laughs> Adobe? Right. Exactly. Adobe got hacked. No, yeah. they hacked a lot, but Adobe got punked. When your when your ransomware survives, survives an acqu- it. Uh, acquisition. Target That's got hacked one. in 2014. That was a huge one. You know, Target. 40 million credit card numbers. 40 million credit and card numbers. And all 40. leaked from an HVAC vendor. So someone pivoted right. from the HVAC vendor from into the their HVAC. network. They had a flat network. The the stuff was on there. So that definitely is a really. That's a. Yeah. Bro, it was yeah. crazy. This was a 2019. Really, really I mean, not 2019. This past, this, this past decade. decade. Uh, we are so. You got Mirai. Remember Mirai? <sighs> Mariah. Remember, remember the Mirai botnet that took down uh, Den DNS. The entire East yeah. Coast was knocked offline. Mm. Like that was just in 2017, 2016. That was in 2016. Yeah, like so. It was, I love hacking. I sit here and talk about not about the last ten years, man. I mean, Ooh. did we say yeah, Eternal Blue? Ooh. Eternal Blue. Ooh. What was the really early virus? Yeah, like, the really early virus. The, what was the, the very first one? Morris worm. Was it the Morris worm? Yeah, that was the first worm ever to spread. That was made by the NSA director's son. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Morris worm. I didn't know that. Yeah. I, I love, bro, you got to love this shit. It's <laughs> nuts. November 2nd, 1988, one of the first computer worms to distribute it via the internet. What was the one that wiped The first ever... felony com- conviction under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, too. First ever. I was, NSA, well, NSA's I was trying to build my own back then. I'm trying to remember. There was, there's actually another one uh, that happened in their earliest days of the ARPANET that no one knows how it did. Someone started like an echo request that kind of went around. It was the first denial of service. Okay. And uh, they talking, don't know who uh, did it. When, when was it? God, it was like in the 70s or oh, so. No. Yeah, it was before. It was one of those things that only spread across the college networks. And uh, they actually just had to start shutting things down. And it was... 
uh, God, someone that was uh, one of the podcasts I listened to had a story on it like last year. It was just great because they have a lot of research they did on that. There's a lot of fun stuff that you can dive into. Um, you know, the one of them I don't know if it's true. It's not really a hack, but it's the um, mail that will only go a couple miles. They can only email people a couple miles away. Mm. It's actually a, it's a network engineering problem mm. that a group of engineers. Uh, found the problem, and the sysadmin says, you guys um, are wrong. That isn't how email works. Gotcha. And uh, the, the short, if you haven't heard this story, it's great. And I, I don't know if it's myth or not, but it completely makes sense from a technical standpoint once you dig into it. So you have a group of engineers at a college, and they realize they can email the next college, but they can't email all the way across the country. Okay. The email doesn't get there. And so they call IT, and they're like, what do you mean? Your email works when you email the close college, but not the far one. Yeah, that's not a real problem. It doesn't work that way. Email works or it doesn't. Right. Back and forth arguing. And they started finding other places. And they built a radius of places they can email mm. and then outside of it. And they realized it's distance-based. And the network engineering team is like, no, email doesn't fucking work that way. Shut right. up. And these guys are like regular engineers. They're like, you know, uh, system, not, not systems guys, but like, you know, standard uh, whatever they do. But it turned out someone had set the TTL on the router. Mm. So the time to live was so short, it could only go so far, and the packets would drop off. So it was able to deliver okay. email a certain amount of miles before the hmm. packet TTL was set wrong. <laughs> yeah, somebody said embedded yeah, some, TTLs yep. in the mail header. Yep. Uh, and yeah, just so the network was actually into switching itself. So there's times that was uh, nice. There's all kinds of fun old stuff. But yeah, there's so many different hacks, and it's, it's really like uh, Xavier says, come down to ransomware now. But there's it's hard to pick which one the biggest one is, but they're all intricate uh the last 10 years wasn't really about ransomware believe it or not it wasn't even really about ddos what it came down to was uh exposed servers default credentials um these were the, the biggest things that got us for the last 10 years mm -hmm. if you look at veeam marriott exactus zynga the rnc dub smash equifax and under armor or my fitness pal they all had servers out on the on the web that either have vulnerabilities that were publicly exposed and not patched, mm -hmm. or they had uh, um, commonly used passwords, or, or their they were fished. Um, One hundred percent was the, that was the last ten years. And you know what the next ten years will look like? That, because <laughs> that's exactly how people are deploying their ransomwares. The only thing that's changed in the mindset of the attacker is, okay, now that I have this foothold, it's starting to become less and less impressive over the last ten years of me getting the foothold. How do I monetize this immediately? Exactly. And with the, the, you know, when you look at the increases in encryption and compute over the last 10 years, look at what a CPU was in 2010. Mm -hmm. Oh, Even yeah. Even though they're still very powerful, look at the kind of efficiency you can get out of one of those AMD processors that are 3.6 oh. fucking gigahertz those. with 65 watts off the chip. It's just like nuts right now. You could do some really interesting things with encryption. And then look at these GPUs, the way that they're threaded and the hyper-threading and, like, mm -hmm. the amount of cores that they have now. We can do big math now more than ever. We're getting closer and closer to quantum computing in the 2020s. So 2010 had been all about like increasing that those levels of encryption. But with that came uh, the ability to to increase the attempts of brute forcing and the attempts of yeah. uh, just raw compute power to and go after these. You know what that, though? I'm gonna say that uh, the biggest awareness raised Snowden. I mean, yeah. he he. When you really, that was the biggest bomb. And when and when you think about what the results are of Snowden, what happened? So 2012, Snowden drops a lot of information out there. What has changed? Well, let's encrypt. Oof. We now, as a matter of fact, TLS 1.3 yep. is a direct result of Snowden's revelations yep. that, mm -hmm. hey, guess what? The government uh, captures the data and then waits, even if they wait for a key to expire, or they will compel a CA to release their DNS keys. DNS over TLS. Yes, mm -hmm. DNS over TLS. That's another way that, that's another direct result from Snowden. He's certainly been influential He's on been the extremely decade. Extremely influential. I wish he would get pardoned. Yeah. I wish Eddie would get pardoned. I think he will in the next 20 years, but I, it'll take some time for the government to kind of get over the fact that he traded. And I've even, I heard this from someone else uh, that post Snowden NSA is dramatically different. Like it actually, then if, 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 the goal it wasn't for him to become famous. Some people, oh, he's just trying to get attention. Mm. And no, no, he his goal is to enact change. And I'm going to say he really met his goal. Well, when I've had people tell me like the dentist has changed, like there's been policy oh, changes, sure. there's been a lot of that. It, there's been a lot more proper behavior. No more people mm. just passing around personal information about mm -hmm. people as a joke. Like they seem to take things more serious. That's what I've heard from people. Uh, and the game changers like DNS, DOH, Mo Mozilla just uh, is 
now has a few more companies. They just announced, I think yesterday, in a blog post that there's a few more places that are going to be partnering with them on DOH. That's a, absolute, All of this is a direct effect. And if you're not familiar with like TLS 1.3, one of the things that does is there's a double key exchange. So you have the your CA that's going to authenticate the session and have it encrypted. But in case anyone ever gets that CA later, even after the fact, they can't even replay the recorded session because there's a secondary key exchange with TLS mm -hmm. 1.3. Um, it's another Diffie that Hellman exchange. That kind of works what looks like Keybase almost. Yeah, it's a, du it's a, uh, a double, double ratchet encrypted. is what they call it. Double ratchet. Yep. So you double the encryption on there, and boom. Now you can't, even if you replay it, you just peel back one layer and have another layer of encryption. So it's not arbitrary encrypt. And those keys are purposely thrown away by the browser. I've, so I've encrypted zip and encrypted zip of a zip that's encrypted. <laughs> so yeah. now if you get my first two passwords, you're just like, yeah. <laughs> last, last encrypted zip. So. I don't know if anyone ever decrypts the Lux drives I do my backups on, they're going to get encrypted VMs. So yeah. it's like... <laughs> That sounds like a hack the box challenge. Oh, yeah. yeah, for sure. Unzip it 35 times Man. just to get the text file. Gotta write the loop. And, and <laughs> on, on the topic loop. of being quantum <laughs> computing, uh, I mean, who would have thought this? Microsoft contributed last year uh, all the new uh, EC curve, um, elliptic curve algorithms for uh, OpenVPN. The, what the, why those matter, those are the quantum proof ones. They mm -hmm. have Microsoft, of all companies, their code contribution has been in cryptography to further enhance what they refer to as the quantum proof encryption. So even though we have not invented yet the functioning quantum computer, we actually in concept know how they work. So therefore, we know how to write an encryption that is also quantum proof. And that has been slowly being rolled out because mm -hmm. we don't know when it'll be invented. But post humusly you go backwards, just like they did with, uh, um, what's his name, the, the Unix inventor, uh, Rich. And he uh, decrypted Stallman. his pat yeah no not Stallman no, uh, uh, the other guy they uh, oh, yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Covered we covered it by we, where they yeah. got his passwords how did they get it well now we're able like Xavier said compute power has come so much further we were able to reverse engineer his 1970s Unix password right <laughs> which was still high entropy for his time stuff's so not quantum proof a lot well technically it's always a lot harder yeah quantum proof is what they call it but yeah it does take longer even a quantum computer won't be able to instantly solve it like current stuff so it's just like how we don't use uh was it des one or what's right. a couple of the retired ones out there uh, we've moved forward because those can be cracked now Sha within one yeah Sha yeah. one we can crack those into amazon uh compute instance for uh, they they as a matter of fact someone made that table if you look up of how much does it cost to crack some of these were like yeah it costs you about five thousand to crack this length password it costs you about ten thousand here mm -hmm. thirty thousand here when you think about a nation state level actor what's 30 g's that's not even as much as they spent on one fucking rocket they found. <laughs> right. Like 30 G's just to compute time. Right. There's no collateral damage. I just get their password. Press the button, man. Press what are you waiting button. for? Decrypt all those passwords. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, what else to tell us have to say here? Let's go through. They had a couple. Uh, Quackbot. Oh, We're still went, seeing through, a lot of that. They went through this year, right? Yeah, they, that's just this year stuff. Quackbot. I didn't really hear about Quackbot too much. Uh, Emotet a lot. Yeah, Emotet. Yeah, was Emotet. Emo I was I was following Emotet in 2018. You can go back and look. Mm -hmm. I was one of the early people that was capturing samples and had the whole entire thing set up, and it was a pain in the ass. That was part of the reason why I actually ended up diving into setting my network up the way that I did because I was working with Emotet, and I'm like, man, I need to start segmenting off my network because I want to start diving deeper into this stuff. Yep. That's mm -hmm. what drove me into in the home lab and a year later I got fucking 12 U of compute. <laughs> <laughs> He's got a rack it's I got him. Um, rack. Got your PF Sense rocking. It's a whole lot in that rack right now. But nevertheless, uh that was yeah, I was huge and and Wanna Cry and Blue, you know, Blue Keep were two huge ones this year. Um, oh yeah. Still and that's also around. old NSA versus new. So old NSA, some of those things they were holding back from abilities. New NSA, we've seen the NSA reporting stuff. Um, mm -hmm. more recently. Oh, and they're giving us tools. Yeah, they're giving us tools. They like released Deidre. the Deidre. So Deidre, yeah. there's another effect of so Snowden overall, the agency realizing being a little bit open more open with security is going to be good for PR, good for recruiting, and maybe better for the overall health of the system. Because you can't sit on these. That's one of the challenges. You can't just sit on these vulnerabilities. Um, security throughout security doesn't work just because you think, oh, I'm smart enough. I found this vulnerability. No one else will find it. Oh, shit, there's a guy over there using it. 
did he get our code? Is it a leak? Oh, no, it's not a leak. They just figured it out, too, because <laughs> they fuzzed just like we did and go, hey, look, there's a few extra registers in RDP. I wonder what happens when you poke them. <laughs> Sheesh. Uh, always fun times here. I think that's what we have. We've been about an hour here. What yeah. else we have? I think we ran through all the news articles, got through all the stuff. Let me drop it in there. Oh, oh yeah, and just this last month, to, to wrap up 19, we saw the the first reports of Blue Keep being exploited in the wild. Yep. So oh, yeah. uh, stay tuned, 2020. <clears throat> yeah, hold on to your fucking hats. Because yeah. Because the first six months is going to be Blue Keep, Blue Keep, Blue Keep. And as long as it's just going to be another methodology. So as we harden systems to get the hackers out, uh You'll they just look for the next level in. Yep. It'll be blue keep, it'll be more ransomwares. And I think personally, we're gonna see less and less DDoS. We're gonna see less and less DDoS. The the, the world's network is getting so much more larger, robust. Mm -hmm. I think we're gonna start to see entire BGP that BGP thing, yeah. I think it's gonna see an uptick in that. These are my predictions yeah. for the next ten years. Because instead of me knocking you offline, what I wanna do is I'm just gonna redirect all your traffic over to me now. So I could just like spy on you or I can drop all these packets or I can inject, infect all of your people in transit with my nice malware that works by well, I'm injecting packets. And it's also the professionals are jumping in it. So especially when you, you think about the, the maturity of the hacker world, a lot of the early hacks had nothing to do more than putting a flag at the top of the mountain. Right. I did it. I hacked it. There's my name. Remember defacing website, pwned by, insert hacker That's name. That's the era I came up in. Just yeah. deface it. Yeah, and it was just fun to do. There was all the silly stuff we did 19 years ago, 20 years ago when I started. You just did it. You stuck your name on it going, yeah. cool, I did it. I, I was really here. Have... I did it. Hell, I might even email your backup on how to undo it. I just want to say I did it, show my friends. All right, it's screenshot. You guys can put it back. I don't yeah. care anymore. I lost interest in this. <laughs> right. Speaking of that, but this is... Monetary. I, I'm going to throw this out here because we haven't had a movie recommendation, but I'll throw this out here. It's not okay. exactly a movie recommendation, but boy, is it fun. This guy over here, and uh, whoops, my uh, one of my staff watches a lot of these videos. He's lo He loves all the vintage stuff, so... Dungeon Master Clever Copy Anti-Piracy. So Modern Vintage Gamer did a deep dive here. It's about 15 minutes. So it's still pretty in-depth. It's all about how the old-school Atari games and stuff like that, mm -hmm. how they did, how they hacked, breakdowns of how they got around the piracy on there, how they, uh, the, the cat and mouse of hackers, and one particular game called Dungeon Master. So most games, back when the Atari's released, they said sometimes before they hit the store shelves, mm -hmm. they were hacking in the BBS days, passing the game around, and it said it took between 1 and 12 hours a game would be cracked. And then this is before the internet, so they had to pass it around from BBS to BBS. Yes. I mean, this is like hackers were real proud of this. There were I remember, and I grew up in this, so I remember the hacking teams when we were cracking all this. And I I don't remember this game specifically because I was more of a Commodore guy. But Dungeon Master had the cleverest hack. It took over a year for hackers to figure it out because they, it plays games with you. It's a mind game. Every time you think you hacked it, every time you think you got along around the copy protection, the game starts to play and locks up in a different position based mm. on the copy protection. You go to throw a sword in the game and the sword floats. And you're like, hold on, it glitched. And you like restart the game and it floats elsewhere. And you're like, oh shit, it's actually a DRM. So there's a whole series of registers that took a groups of hackers to play. It became the game became yeah, less that, about the game. I was game. gonna say is, that sounds like the game now. Oh, it was just it was just so great when he went through every little detail of this, of how to do it, all the dat files and stuff. And he's got a bunch of other ones about how to get in copy protection of all kinds, how people broke arcade ones, how people broke our uh, the Nintendo DRM on the mm -hmm. chips by yeah, actually reversing. Yeah, I watched that channel a lot. Dude, it's in, I will tell you, if you want, it's a cool to think about how the old school stuff, and it still gives you ideas for the new school stuff. It was mm -hmm. a great watch. I, I went through a bunch of his videos. I started at one, you know, the rabbit hole was deep. <laughs> <laughs> I watched one of his videos where it showed how to, uh, I guess, like rip games off the old cartridges. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. There's a lot of them. And I, I love collecting all those vintage games and everything else. So. Yeah, I gotta love it. Definitely pretty cool. Oh, and I, I did finish Mr. Robot. I did enjoy it. Um, it's it is long like most of I think which is it season two lost you yeah season two's rough yeah they spend a me. lot of time in Elliot's head and he's puking and stuff that's yeah that's <laughs> where I, it lost me I thought they took that too that's the only complaint I had out of all the seasons the last season was amazing season three was good season four the ending was unexpected um, different and interesting I won't spoil anything for you but I thought it was a good completion really dark like they just went. 
well, this show's over. We're rolling dark with this. We're yeah. going to just do things. It's been dark the whole time. So yeah, it It's been sense. dark. It yeah, it really pushed hard. So. I'll probably have time to check it out now since I'll be somewhere new with no friends. I'll be watching that. Stanks Vision. Shout out to Stanks Vision. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll be just watching shows. It's good to sometimes do that. Sit down and watch that. So I was, I, I was. I'll be working. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just in uh, SOW RFP mode. <laughs> trying to. Are we didn't talk about check rain. That's one of the biggest. Uh, talking, about the, of, uh, talking about the thing that that was just this past year though. It really the past couple of months. I mean, that's a big thing though. That affects a lot of people. How many people have an iPhone? It yeah. made you buy an entirely new iPhone. No, no, no. Check rain. So for no, that was uh, the other one. Check rain didn't make me buy my iPhone. Uh, oh, what was one. the name of the one? Check, that, uh, it's the a jailbreak. One. Checkmate. It, it, checkmate, isn't checkmate. it? Checkmate. No, Checkrain was, was the, when people yeah. was uploading the fake Checkmate. Yeah, the got fake, it. And the then it checkmate. was installing malware on okay. people's you know, phone iPhones that they thought were getting jailbroken. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's just say there's enough content that we have no problems. Like next year, we're going to be busy. There's going to be more stories. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it ain't slowing down. Nope. We're we're not gonna be like, hey, there's nothing else to talk about. Darknet Diaries will still have plenty of content as well, yeah. plenty of deep dives, and plenty we'll, of. I'm sure in January when all the Christmas hacks uh, finally get exposed. Oh yeah, it, this is there's no doubt Shoot. during the holidays there's a bunch of people and until they open up January first they don't even know how pwned they are. Exactly, <laughs> types of people: those who are pwned and those who don't know they are pwned. It's, mm-hmm. it's hackers that just wait until those off days. They know you're not gonna be. Oh there. yeah, they know the the everyone's like people on vacation. People People out of town. Mm-hmm. I'm um, yeah, the manufacturing uh, companies. We have a few of them. Like we completed some server projects, but literally they're not. They we they they had to send in a crew to test today because no one was supposed to be in. Mm. So we finished the migration project. We we're supposed to finish it by next weekend. We finished it early because it went really well. Uh, that's rare, I know, but we, I did some planning. <laughs> to, you know, but they had to send a crew in. Like if they would have had a, a security incident, other than the fact that we're starting, we're taking them over mm-hmm. during this Christmas from the previous IT. But if there was an incident, they wouldn't have really known until after the New Year's. Yeah, <laughs> they just take two weeks off. So we'll see. Yeah, fun times. Uh, Maze has a public dump site. How come they aren't being tracked down? I don't know. Fun stuff. All right. Well, there's nothing else for the good of the class. Nope. Let me make sure I drop all these show notes in here. And since we won't see you guys again, Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Definitely Happy New Year. And hopefully we can get Mo on sometime soon. I try not to make it too long. Yeah. And go through the show notes. There's a couple other things in there that are some good reads. They don't want to just hear my voice. You can't do the Google Voice. Or the yeah. Zoom, we got Zoom. Yeah, I got Zoom. Oh yeah, I got Zoom. Yeah, I got I pay I got the paid version of Zoom, so we have unlimited. It's okay. gonna be up. I pay for it so I can do uh, interviews. Mo just need to plug in his camera, man. Dude, it works on the phone really well. I've interviewed a couple of people who just use their phone. They put it on a little little stand, so it's not looking up their nose. And <laughs> oh, yeah, I'll definitely uh, <laughs> jump on from our cardboard box since Washington D.C. is. So expensive. Yes. Not the cardboard box. So Zero tier versus wire guard. Here's the thing. Neither one of those on. have been <laughs> completely code vetted. They're both really solid products. Neither one's been super code vetted. And they kind of have different use cases. Wire guard's a VPN. Zero tier's yeah. a interesting connection tool for... I wouldn't say that Zero Tier is a VPN. It's more it's SD-WAN. Not. It really is. Point it's, to point. Yeah, it's a point-to-point SD-WAN solution. It does mm-hmm. have routing capabilities as an add-on, mm-hmm. but you're going to get very different latency compared to a straight-up VPN. I wonder if we can make a Zero Tier module for PFSense. You can. There is one. Oh, there is one? Yeah. I'm going to find it. Uh, it's not it. part of official PFSense, but mm. the third party one works. If you look for zero tier PFSense, there's a GitHub repository and instructions. Okay. Yeah, it's not works. an official add on, so whenever you do any major updates to PFSense, remove it and then put it back. But it runs in BSD, so you can actually just run it from the command line of oh, PFSense, yeah, yeah, too. Yeah, true, 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 true. But um, yeah, that's a whole. A lot of people ask me that, but zero tier, you're going to get higher latency with zero tier because you're not doing a router connection. Also, unless you design your own control plane, 
the control plane for zero tier is still controlled by the, the person who runs zero tier right. and their infrastructure. Mm -hmm. right. Now, I have no reason to believe that it's not secure, but just think about that. You offer this access on all your computers. You're not the one in control of the control plane. It's not a zero trust system. You have to trust that control plane. If someone were to hack the control plane, they have access and can add and remove any devices on your network. Versus anytime you do a VPN, one to one. You, unless you've decided to share it with someone else, you've controlled the VPN from this computer to the endpoint um, with only people you've shared in between. Mm -hmm. So, and that, I still prefer OpenVPN. Uh, it's been heavily code audited. It's been code audited by two separate huge companies have gone through and done it, including uh, what's that guy, John Hopkins University um, guy, uh, Matthew Green. So Hello Cryptographer has gone through it. Another uh, nationally recognized company has gone through it. Um, it supports tons of different encryption algorithms. OpenVPN is solid. It's built into every Linux system natively. It's easily loaded on Windows. I don't see a reason not to use it. WireGuard's faster, but yeah. So anyways, I could rant about that forever. <laughs> open source. SD-WAN recommendation open source. Back to zero tier. I don't know anyone besides zero tier that's SD-WAN open source. They, I can't name a second one. Nope. I'm not, not aware of one existing. Not that I know of. No. Yeah. And... It's because of the nature of the way it works. Most people have a really proprietary system because it requires part of it has to live in a data center, not in your office. Mm -hmm. Most SD WAN solutions look like that. Is exposing RDP to the WAN safe? No. No, don't do that. <laughs> if no, limiting no. Sorry, Ron. I mm -mm. no, I just don't think that it's worth it. I can't. I, find I wouldn't it. risk it, it. It wouldn't be worth it. Just install zero tier. Yeah. Don't don't. Yeah. I mean, you can limit it and say a single IP address. But you're slippery slope. Yeah, you. That's I. I would say that's minimally acceptable. I mean, if you had to, but you. Have, here's the thing: if you're running something like PFSense, which is free and open source, and you load OpenVPN, RDP works amazing. There's no OpenVPN does not yeah. have latency or anything. Yeah, it's like it, we literally have done this for massive medical no companies. RDP on the win. Yeah, we just have the only thing when we set up these medical places is OpenVPN. We install that all day. We put it on a bunch of people's desktop. That's how our clients access their computers internally. It's a solid system. It's not hard to use and really fucking secure. So hopefully that helps. Firewall it off, make a simple VPN. Yeah, I highly recommend VPN only. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah, I think I think Zero Tier's a trustworthy company. There's nothing about them that's making me think. I've actually talked with the developer, a great guy. I think he's yeah, had a conversation yeah, I, with too. I know a couple of people over at Zero Tier. They're very responsive, small team. Yeah, small team, very responsive, tight system. Um, I think they do it really well. And they do give the opportunity. You can run your own control plane with it. Yeah, they, you can. Yeah. You can download yeah, it. You can go get a Zero Tier Edge. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, a, it's an open source project. Or you can buy the Edge from them, which I don't know if they're selling them still. Uh, they're not but selling that anymore. Just like a, it's almost like a naked, or a, uh, excuse me, Edge Router. Yeah. It's almost like the, the Ubiquity Edge Router yep. where... You know, if you want to drop up, it's like point to point. I mean, uh, excuse me, site to site. Right. It's turning some router with four ports into um, like a, a virtual switch of sorts that's internet connected. And yeah, doing they've got some cool WAN. projects on them. I mean, you can do routing with it and things like that. So it's definitely but the WAN part, right? W A N. So if you're putting stuff on there, you got to expect it to treat it as if it's WAN. Right. You know, it's not your LAN. It's not SD LAN. It's SD WAN. Your SD LAN is your ubiquity gear or, you know. Right. And, and when you think about things, like, sense. I take my laptop everywhere in hostile environments, so I always make sure, by default, well, when I get my computer, I harden it. I make sure all the firewalls, no ports mm -hmm. open, no, uh, nothing's turned on, no services running, and firewall just to, you know, have that whole safety. That way, if I accidentally started SSH for something I'm working on, it's not publicly exposed because even though, you know, it's here at my office where I feel somewhat safe, it's, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm sitting next to these guys, you know, I could be. I never feel safe. <laughs> My adversaries are upstream, so yeah. I can I can never feel safe. They're not <laughs> on my network. They're on my network's network. You get what I'm saying? Like, I, I'm a part of someone else's network that I have no control over. Yeah. That is riddled with spies, basically. You need a good, easy guide for hosting it. There's not an easy guide for hosting your own control plane for zero tier because that back end is complicated. It is mm -hmm. That is the value they provide. Is you being better like it. networking. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of engineering you got to do. They have all the code there, but yeah, building the control plane yourself, um, they call it, it the moons. I think it, exactly, yeah. yeah. yeah, the, yeah the they have instructions system. how to build your own moons, but they're not, it's not, 
Well, you can spin up like a digital ocean because it does have to be public facing. So you spin up a digital ocean instance with the moon and you don't connect to the planetary servers as they're called. So you say only these devices federate against these moons, uh, add these devices and build my own networking stack in there. As a matter of fact, you can do it in two ways. You can actually start with their control plane to build out yours, then pass it all off to the moon so you eliminate theirs. That way you're eliminating the ability to add other uh, systems in it. I mean, I don't know. It's, it's a lot of work. Yeah, I think that the better time is better spent figuring out how to encrypt those communications that go over there public. I, I believe that using the inter, the public internet as your backbone for your private business is totally acceptable. Yep. You, you shouldn't have to have a land if you don't want to. No. Um, I think you should be able to put everything on the DMZ if you have taken the, the proper precautions. Mm -hmm. That's the reason why uh, it's, I mean, that's how businesses are working right now. We're, yeah. we're moving closer and closer. We're de deteriorating this perimeter, starting to adopt more and more cloud services already. But for the remaining things that we can't put onto the cloud, if we could just figure out how to properly configure and encrypt, then you don't really have to worry about bad things happening. Yeah. Well, you really don't. No. And we, we do that. We've even set up some clients where they have an AWS instance with, um, instead of a public exposing, they actually have it behind a firewall. So we have an IPsec uh, connection between their office and their infrastructure. Mm -hmm. uh, they still have some local servers and they push things back out to their cloud. And then there's pinholes in the cloud for the public side of their application uh, server so it can actually function for what its uh, purpose is. And it, to them, it's transparent. They, to them, it's like it's in their office. So you can create these transparencies like that. So yeah, and it's a lot better. MPLS is just so dang expensive. I yeah. <laughs> All right, I think we babbled on enough. You want to press that button? So yes. Sir. I'll give one it. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. See you guys See next you year. Guys See you guys next 2020. decade. Twenty twenty. Twenty twenty. Peace. All the twenty twenty jokes. Did you go press with it. the button. How can we peace and we didn't press the button? <laughs>